Thank you. Uh, is the mic working? Yes. Great. All right. Well, thanks to Ron for that wonderful introduction. Thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, so yes, as was said, I'm Lindsay Cooper, and I'm really excited to be talking with you today about abstractions for expressive and efficient parallel and distributed computing. So I recently joined the computer science and engineering department at UC Santa Cruz over on the best coast. <laughs> And uh, in my job there, and before that, as was mentioned, for four years at Intel Labs, and then before that, during my PhD work, I've spent a lot of time thinking about two big problems in, in computer science. And these problems are, first, how do we build correct and efficient parallel systems? That is, how do we build systems that let us do many computations at the same time so that we can compute as fast as possible and yet still correctly? And second, how do we build correct and efficient distributed systems? That is, how do we build systems that let us do computation in many places across a network that's subject to network partitions and unbounded, unbounded latencies between those places and yet still do it correctly? And these problems of how to build correct and efficient parallel systems and how to build correct and efficient distributed systems each have a research community around them and the communities have each developed their own culture and their own vocabulary and their own formalisms. And so I think it's helpful to try to find the unifying abstractions that can help us understand and hopefully make progress on both. And to that end, I work on programming language based approaches that address these problems from both theoretical and applied points of view. And this talk is going to have a little bit of both. So on the theoretical side, I'm gonna talk about my work on lattice based data structures or LVARs, and this is a new foundations for expressive, deterministic, parallel, and distributed programming. And ELVARs generalize previous approaches to guaranteed deterministic programming, and I'm going to show how we used ELVARs to parallelize some applications that have traditionally been hard for deterministic uh, parallel programming models. And I'll talk a little bit about how this work kind of extends naturally to a distributed setting, too. And then on the more applied side, I'm going to talk about work on what I call non-invasive domain-specific languages for parallel programming. And this is work that I did with my Intel colleagues about safe deterministic parallelization without requiring invasive changes to the source code that you're parallelizing. And uh, my colleagues and I at Intel implemented a non-invasive DSL called Parallel Accelerator that we released as a Julia package. And we used it to parallelize code written in the Julia programming language and made it run orders of magnitude faster. And the guiding principle and goal of all of this work and the theme of this talk is to try to find the right high level abstractions to express computation in a way that not only doesn't compromise efficiency, but actually enables it. And it seems at first like it's a contradiction, right? Because ordinarily we think the received wisdom is that making things high performance requires us to go low level and close to the metal. But it turns out that if we have a high level representation of programmer intent, then that can enable smart scheduling choices or optimizations that would be hard or impossible otherwise. And this principle of finding the right high level abstractions to enable efficiency that's been so fruitful in this work on parallel and distributed systems, well, it turns out to also bear fruit in an area of research that I recently got excited about, which is using SMT solvers to formally verify properties of neural networks, and especially those that are used in safety critical systems, and doing that more efficiently than was previously possible. So I'll talk a bit about that, and then finally I'm going to try to outline a research agenda that connects that work back to language-based approaches to parallel and distributed systems. So it's a lot to cover in one talk, but let's jump in. Uh, so to start with, let's talk about deterministic programming. And by that I mean programming in such a way that given certain inputs to a program, the observable output of the program is going to be the same. And I'll try to illustrate this with a story. Um, so let's suppose that one day I'm shopping at my favorite large corporate online store. And right now my shopping cart is empty. So it just so happens, and those of you who have heard me give, give talks will already know this, that at my favorite large corporate online store, all the code is written in Haskell. So the programmers have defined a data type that lists all the items that are available for purchase, and they're representing the contents of my shopping cart as a key value map where the keys are items and the values are the quantities that I'm buying of those items. And this code happens to be Haskell, but we could do the same thing in OCaml or any language of your choice. So this map is stored in what's known in Haskell as an IO ref. And that means that it can be shared between parallel tasks. And when this IO ref is first created here, uh, its initial contents are an empty map, uh, meaning that my cart's empty. So all the items I buy have to get added to this cart somehow. 
So in particular, the store that I'm shopping at is known for its fine selection of books. So I add a book to my cart, and doing so launches a thread that modifies the contents of the cart and adds the book that I picked by calling this insert function uh, in a quantity of one. And this happens asynchronously, so I can keep shopping while that's going on. So the store also offers all kinds of other fine merchandise. So along with my book, I add a pair of shoes to my cart as well, and that thread runs asynchronously as well. OK, now, so now suppose I want to look at the contents of my cart, and suppose that that computation happens in yet another thread. Uh, but this time, I want the value that the computation returns. So I have to wait for that thread that I spawn to complete. I return my cart's contents, and that ends up being what this whole program evaluates to. So what do you think the contents of my cart are going to be? What does this program evaluate to? If I were to print p at this point, what would I get? Well. I tried running this code on my laptop, and I ran it a few hundred times, just to be sure. And the answer seems to be, well, it depends, right? So the first time I ran it, I got both the book and the shoes. But sometimes I just got the shoes. And sometimes I just got the book. So this is a non-deterministic program. And that seems less than ideal, right? It would be nice if, when I look at my shopping cart, what I see is not subject to the whim of the language runtime system and how it chose to schedule the addition of items to my cart. And although this particular program is only running on one machine, the problem is only exacerbated, of course, when we run it in a distributed setting on many machines. And we'll talk more about that later. So this happened because our program has two tasks that are sharing state with each other. But sharing is a nice thing to do, right? Sharing is caring. And these tasks are not so much sharing, I say, as fighting viciously over a piece of state. So the slogan that I like to use is that if we want determinism, we have to find a way to share nicely. So what went wrong here? Well, one way of explaining what went wrong is to say, well, this program that we wrote is under-synchronized. And we need to put in more synchronization. And if all we wanted to do was fix this under-synchronization in this particular program, then we, can't, we could do that. So in this case, we'd probably have to return something from each of these two async calls and then wait for those actions to finish, and then, and only then, do the read. And this process of having to put in synchronization barriers in the right places to make sure that your code is correct is pretty common. And I would bet that a lot of us have had to write code that did the equivalent of that at some point in our lives. But rather than fixing individual programs in an ad hoc way like this, what we might like to do instead is come up with a programming model such that all programs written in the model are guaranteed to be deterministic. So let's look back at the non-deterministic version of our shopping cart program. So we can see that this code is guilty of the mortal sin of doing two multiple, multiple writes to the same shared data structure. And ruling out programs that do that has been the foundation of a significant body of work on deterministic programming. And a particularly prominent example of that is something called IVARs. And IVARs are shared variables that can only be written to once and for which reads block until that one write has arrived. And the I in IVAR stands for immutable. And if you want to know more about IVARs, you can look up uh, Arvin's work uh, from the 80s on the id programming language. So in an IVAR-based language, oh, and by the way, IVARs are also, if you use the monad par package in Haskell, it also has IVARs, uh, as well as other languages. Um, so in an IVAR-based language, uh, you would not be able to write a program with a non-determinism bug like this. In fact, that combination that IVARs have of single writes and blocking reads ensures determinism for programs in which all communication happens through IVARs. So IVARs are very useful. But on second thought, is, is this program really so terrible? Because even though these threads are both writing to the same shared data structure, notice that neither one is really clobbering the other state. Instead, it builds on the other one's state. And so in fact, these first two threads updates commute. And so it's OK for them to run in arbitrary order. The non-determinism that we saw earlier when we saw that this program produced different results that is only introduced at the point when the IORF is read, and we are at risk of accidentally observing an intermediate state before both of the threads have had a chance to write. So what if we could take inspiration from IVARs, but loosen that restriction that they're only allowed to write once, while keeping around a form of block and read that can prevent the order of updates from being observed? And that's what LVARs do. So like IVARs, LVARs are data structures that can be shared among multiple threads, but it's fine to write to an LVAR multiple times. And the rules are, these writes have to be commutative, meaning that they can happen in arbitrary order. So for instance, it doesn't matter whether we add the book or the shoes to our shopping cart first. 
And second, rights have to be inflationary, which means that with every right, the Elvar's contents have to stay the same or grow bigger with respect to an application-specific ordering of states or a lattice. So instead of L for immutable, we have L for, or instead of I for immutable, we have L for lattice. And finally, Elvar reads have to be uh, what we call threshold reads, and I'll explain that next. So we'll walk through another program that adds things to our cart, but this time the cart is represented by an Elvar. So uh, what are the states that our cart can be in? Well, it can be empty, and that's represented by the bottom element of this lattice. Or we could have one copy of the book, or two copies, or so on, or one pair of shoes, or two, or so on, or it could have both in some combination. So we'll look at how the state of the cart changes as we add things. So we start at the bottom of this lattice, and in this program here, we fork a couple of threads, and each of those does a write. And those threads can run in arbitrary order. So if the first thread, this one that adds uh, shoes to my cart, happens to run first, then we would move up into the appropriate lattice state. And then if the other thread ran, we would move up again. But we could have also done that in the other order. So starting at the bottom, we could add the book to the cart, or the books, rather, because we're getting two books this time, and then the shoes. And either way, we would end up in the same place. So now let's try doing a read. This is the fun part. So what we want to do is here, we're given a key. We want to get the value associated with that key. So we want to know, in this case, how many copies of the book are in my cart. And this get key operation could run before either of those forked threads finish. Uh, but it might block at that point. So I mentioned earlier that IVAR reads are blocking reads. If you try to read from an IVAR before it's been filled in, your read will block. But when it is filled in, your read will unblock, and you'll be able to see the exact complete contents of the IVAR. LVAR reads are also blocking, but they're what we call threshold reads. So what a threshold read does is it designates a subset of elements in the lattice that serve as a sort of threshold, such that if the actual state of the LVAR reaches a point that's at or above any of those threshold elements, then the read can unblock and return a result. But the result it returns is not necessarily going to be the exact LVAR contents. It's just going to be the element of the threshold set that we crossed over on our way up the lattice. Uh, so at the point that this read unblocks, uh, the shoes might be in the card or they might not. But regardless of whether they're there yet, this operation is going to return a deterministic result, two books. And one thing that I think helps in trying to understand threshold sets is to visualize a sort of tripwire going across the lattice. So the LVAR state moves up over time, and eventually it might cross the tripwire. And at that point, that's when we're allowed to unblock and return a result. But the result will be the same on every run. It'll be a particular element of the threshold set, regardless, regardless of the timing of when we cross the tripwire. So for something, you might ask, what, what are the conditions on these threshold sets? This seems important. Uh, and it, indeed, it is. So for something to be a legal threshold set, uh, we need a particular mathematical property called pairwise incompatibility to hold of it. Uh, and that, that happens to be true here. Um, but in this code, I'm using a data structure from my Elvar library. And that data structure's API only provides read operations like get key that can be expressed in terms of these legal threshold sets. So I didn't have to think about threshold sets or pairwise incompatibility or any of that when I was writing the code. I just had to use what the library gave me. So in general, the obligation on somebody who wants to implement a new one of these Elvar data structures is that they have to make sure that writes are commutative and inflationary, and they have to make sure that whatever operations they provide for reading from the Elvar can be expressed in terms of these threshold sets. And if they meet those obligations, then determinism will be guaranteed in the client code. So that's how Elvar writes and reads work. And next, I want to look at a kind of a more interesting problem that's traditionally been hard for deterministic programming models. And this is parallel graph traversal. So all right, so let's say that we have a directed graph like this one. And we want to consider the problem of traversing this graph, starting from a given node and finding all the nodes that are reachable from it. And we want to do this in parallel so it's fast. So ordinarily, the algorithm for doing this could go something like the following. So we have a starting node, and we mark it as having been seen. And then we look at its neighbors, maybe launching a thread for each one. And uh, for each neighbor, we check to see if it's marked as having been seen yet. If so, then that thread is done. And if not, then we mark it as seen, and we launch a thread for each of its neighbors. Uh, and we keep going like this. And this goes on until all of the reachable nodes have been seen. So as we traverse the graph, notice that that uh, set of seen nodes over on the right just grew monotonically because we kept on adding the neighbors of seen nodes to that set. And you do this until the set reaches a fixed point. So because this algorithm involves this monotonically growing data structure, you might think at, it might seem 
to be a nice match for that LVARS programming model that I talked about. We could use an LVAR to represent this set of C nodes, have different threads writing to it, have set union as the write operation that adds new nodes to the set. But unfortunately, we cannot express this algorithm using only the threshold reads that I talked about before because there's no way to check if a node has been seen or not. And without that test, we won't know when to stop looking for new nodes. In fact, uh, this particular graph has a cycle in it, uh, so we could get stuck. So what do we do? Well, the way that we accomplish this with LVARS is by extending uh, the, the API a little bit to use what we call events and event handlers. So we say that an event is a write that changes an LVARS state, and an event handler is associated with an LVAR and listens for state changing updates to that LVAR, such as a new node arriving in the set of seen nodes. And an event handler can run a callback in re reaction to an event. And then we also have a quies operation that will block until all of the callbacks that were launched by a particular event handler are done running. So with these ingredients, we have almost everything that we need to write our parallel graph traversal. And it could look something like this code. And there's just one more piece that we need. Uh, so, and that's an operation called freeze. So the freeze operation is a non-blocking read that lets us find out the exact contents of an LVAR. And once an LVAR has been frozen, its state can't change anymore, and any further writes that would change its state instead raise an exception. Uh, but even if we forget to quiesce before we freeze, or even if we do it in the wrong place, the only bad thing that can happen in this programming model by freezing too early is that we raise a right after freeze exception. So formally, our determinism result says that if we have two executions starting from a particular program configuration, and those two executions end, then either the ending configurations are the same, or one or the other of the ending configurations is the error configuration. So for instance, to make this really concrete, it's not possible to see a shopping cart that doesn't have all our stuff in it. Instead, you're either going to see the complete contents of the cart or you'll get an error. And if you hit the error case, then it always means that there's a synchronization bug in your code. And the error message can even tell you exactly which write and which freeze were racing with each other so that you can more easily debug it. So I, I want to take a second to talk about this, uh, this quasi-determinism result and the structure of the proof. By the way, we call this quasi-determinism because it's either the same answer every time or an error, it, uh, as opposed to determinism, which is just the same answer every time. So for simplicity to, uh, simplicity's sake, I'm just going to talk about determinism, but the structure of the quasi-determinism proof is similar. So determinism says the following. It says, suppose you start from a given program configuration, which is just, it's a snapshot of the contents of memory plus an expression that you're evaluating. And you step it or run it until it can't run anymore. You've reached a value. And then you do it again. You step it or run it until it can't run anymore. Determinism says that those two results are going to be equal. And note that we're not claiming to necessarily go through the same series of reduction steps on both runs. We're just claiming that the outcome is the same. And this is sometimes called external determinism. So how do you prove this? So to prove this, uh, in, in our setting, uh, we needed a property that I call independence that captures the idea that independent effects commute with each other. And I'm not going to explain every detail here. I just want to talk about the shape of it. So what does this property say? It's an inference rule. So the truth of the thing above the line implies the truth of the thing below. And this inference rule says that if you have a program configuration, so this S here is the store, that's like the contents of memory that I mentioned before, and the E is an expression. So that's a program configuration, and you take a step with it. And this, this property says that if you do that, then you will also be able to take a step and end up with the same ending expression, even if the starting store is bigger in a particular way. In other words, our ability to take that step and end up with that ending expression is independent of whether the store looks like it did on the top or if it looks like it did on the bottom. And that's how this property gets its name, independence. So why am I showing you this? Well, to give you an idea of why I think this is cool, I want to put it next to uh, what's known as the frame rule from separation logic, which is one of the really cool developments in program verification from the last 20 years. And the frame rule is also written like an inference rule. So again, the truth of the thing above the line implies the truth of the thing below. So what does the frame rule say? It says, 
if you have a program, in this case C, the program is called C, it's a, C, C stands for command. Frame rules kind of come from this imperative world. So C stands for command. Uh, so, so you have this program called C, and it runs starting in a state that satisfies precondition P, ending in a state that satisfies postcondition Q. If you have that, then it does not do any harm to also have this other disjoint property R be true when the program runs. So R might be, I don't know, an assertion about some memory location that's outside of the memory footprint of the program. And the star here in P star R and Q star R says that R is disjoint from P or Q, those other assertions. So the truth of R will not change the execution of our program. And furthermore, the execution of our program won't change the truth of this unrelated thing R. So if you already know that if you start from P, you can run C and get to Q, you know that if you also have R to begin with, C won't interfere with the truth of R. And furthermore, R won't interfere with the postcondition tr uh, being true. So there's this nice non-interference. And the frame rule, I think, is a nice way of talking about what doesn't change when you run a piece of code. And it gets its name from this notion of the frame problem, uh, which McCarthy and Hayes wrote about uh, in 1969 when they were writing about AI and philosophy. And they have this really kind of charmingly dated example uh, in one of their papers where they say, in proving that one person could get into conversation with another, we were obliged to add the hypothesis that if a person has a telephone, he still has it after looking up a number in the telephone book. And obviously, you know, a lot has changed since 1969. Uh, we don't really use telephone books anymore, and uh, we don't default to male pronouns. Um, but it's, it's still the case that in formal systems, you usually have to put a lot of effort into talking about what does not change. And a frame rule is one way of addressing that. So this independence property that I have here is a frame property, if you squint. And except that instead of having that star, that separating conjunction where the pieces you're considering have to be disjoint, up here, the pieces are actually allowed to overlap in memory, but you can still reason about them as if they were separate. So we have this idea of disjointness and use it to reason about things that do overlap but don't interfere. And I think this is an example of actually what I meant at the beginning of this talk when I said that our goal was to find the right high-level abstractions to enable efficient computation. Because it turns out that knowing that these two pieces of state won't interfere with each other gives the runtime system the freedom to be able to schedule things however it wants and take advantage of whatever parallel resources exist and ultimately make programs run faster. So I said at the beginning of this talk that I was going to talk about parallel and distributed computing. So far, I've been talking a lot about parallelism. But I want to say something about how these ideas also apply to distributed computing. Um, so let's talk about distributed computing. And so effectively programming distributed systems, as I said, means writing programs in such a way that they run correctly across a network that's subject to network partitions and other kinds of failures. And one of the things that makes distributed programming so hard is that you have state that's replicated across a number of physical locations. And we saw before that it's hard to keep the contents of our shopping cart uh, deterministic, or it's hard to keep code that operates on our shopping cart deterministic, right? And as, as if that isn't hard enough just to deal with our shopping cart when it's running on my laptop, imagine if it's replicated in data centers around the world, as it almost certainly actually is. So ideally, it would be the case that every replica always agrees on the data or the contents of my cart. But in practice, that won't be true, because that goal is in tension with our desire for this system to be highly available for both reading and writing. And as if that wasn't hard enough, we also have to deal with parts of the network catching on fire and being unable to talk to each other from time to time. So, well, the, for the CAP theorem from distributed systems tells us that if we want to be robust to these inevitable network partitions, we have to compromise on at least one of consistency or availability. And if we want to have high availability, we sacrifice strong consistency, sometimes for what's known as eventual consistency, in which replicas may not always agree, and the only guarantee is that they'll eventually come to agree. But that leaves us with a new problem, which is how do we get all replicas to agree? And if they differ, how do we know which one is right? And so we could try to update them to the one that's most recently written, but 
It's not necessarily a great idea because even if we can figure out which one is most recently written, which is itself a hard problem, we, that might not be the semantics that we want. So there's a, a nice quotation about this that I want to share from the Dynamo paper on Amazon's distributed key value cloud storage system. And this has to do with application specific mechanisms for resolving conflicts between replicas. So they say the application can, quote, decide on the conflict resolution method that's best suited for its client's experience. For instance, the application that manages, uh, maintains customer shopping carts can choose to merge the conflicting versions and return a single unified shopping cart. So in other words, they're saying that if two replicas disagree on what your cart is, then that's okay. You can combine them in some way that makes sense for your application rather than trying to figure out which one wrote last. So this was a very influential paper. Um, it heavily influenced, for instance, the design of distributed databases like React and Cassandra. And uh, a little while after this paper was published, uh, Mark Shapiro and his collaborators formalized some of the ideas that I'm talking about here uh, as what they called conflict-free replicated data types, or CRDTs. And CRDTs are data structures based on the idea that if you can define a lattice for the states that an object in the data store can be in, then replicas of that object that differ can merge with one another in a deterministic way because that domain-specific conflict resolution operation is just the least upper bound operation in this lattice. So that sounds kind of familiar. So because CRDTs are already kind of a cousin to the LVARs that I talked about earlier, what, one, you, one thing that you might think about doing is trying to bring LVAR style threshold reads to the setting of CRDTs. So this is nice because it, it could give us a deterministic way to query the contents of CRDTs. So coming back to this shopping cart idea, if you want to know whether the book is in the cart, you could ask a bunch of replicas whether it's there, and the query will block only until it appears at one of them, not until it appears at all of them. So you could have a deterministic query, even though the data store isn't necessarily consistent. And this suggests a way to save on synchronization costs. And this, I think, is in line, again, with our guiding principle about choosing the right high-level abstractions to unlock efficiency. And it's related to that frame property that I was talking about earlier. And I have a workshop paper that talks about this a little bit, but I think there's more to do here, actually. And if you're interested, I'd love to talk to you more about it later. All right, so we've talked about lattice-based data structures and how they generalize existing approaches to building guaranteed deterministic parallel and distributed systems, and how this is an example of this principle of finding the right high-level abstractions to enable efficiency. And so for the next part of the talk, I want to switch gears and talk about this principle in a different context in this work on non-invasive DSLs for productive <coughs> parallelism. So I want to start by introducing you to my friend Laura. This is Laura. And Laura worked in a research group that collects radar data by flying a plane over Antarctica, transmitting radar pulses, and listening for and recording the result, which appears in radargrams like this one. Uh, so I think this is actually a picture of, uh, of ice and water uh, under the ice. And by studying, and, and rocks underneath that, and so by studying this radar profile, they can learn more about the ice and the rocks beneath the surface. So, Laura wants to spend her time thinking about geophysics. She does not want to spend her time thinking about manual memory management or how to schedule parallel tasks. So when she writes code, she uses what I will call a productivity programming language, like MATLAB or Python or R or Julia. But once she has a working prototype in one of those languages, a dilemma comes up. When she wants to scale up her code to run on a larger input size or at a finer granularity, and this productivity language turns out to be too slow. So the next step, usually, is to port the slow parts of the code from the productivity language to what I'll call an efficiency language, which is usually C or C++ or Fortran. And doing this requires expertise in the efficiency language. It usually also requires expertise in high-performance computing tools like OpenMP. And the result is code that is indeed faster, but it's usually also more brittle, and it's harder to experiment with, and it's harder to maintain. And this is sometimes called the two-language problem. So one proposed solution to this two-language problem is using uh, what are known as high-performance domain-specific languages. And an example of work done in this space is uh, the Delight framework for building high-performance DSLs, uh, which was developed by Kunle Olokutun's group at Stanford. And I really like this unicorn picture, which Kunle uses in all his talks, and which I borrowed from the Delight team. And the idea is that if you pick a language like Python or Julia, you get productivity and generality. And if you pick one like C++, you get performance and generality. And the combination of all three is this magical unicorn doesn't exist. 
Uh, but what the delight people found is that by giving up generality and restricting things to a particular domain, you can offer both a high-level programming model and high performance. So once again, it's this guiding principle of finding the right high-level abstractions. Because it turns out that if the compiler knows a little more about what you're trying to do, it can use that information to make smarter optimizations. I find this to be a really beautiful idea. But if these high-performance DSLs built using these wonderful tools like Delight are so great, then why are they not more widely used by practitioners like my friend Laura? So I think there are a couple of reasons. One is the learning curve. If you have an existing body of code in Julia or Python, then learning the DSL and porting code to it is a lot to ask. Maybe it's easier than porting to C++, but it's probably still a pain. And then there are functionality cliffs. What if the DSL only does 95% of what you need it to do? Then you can't use the DSL. And it's hard for even the most well-designed DSL to anticipate every use case that you might eventually encounter. So my colleagues and I at Intel Labs when I was there spent some time thinking about these problems. And what we ended up coming up with was this system called Parallel Accelerator, which is what we call a non-invasive domain-specific language. So what do I mean by non-invasive? Well, Parallel Accelerator is an embedded DSL, meaning we start with an existing programming language. In this case, it's Julia. But unlike most embedded DSLs, it's mostly focused on speeding up execution of particular constructs that are already present in the language. In particular, it's mostly targeting numeric code that can be expressed with aggregate array operations. So it's easy to get started coming from plain Julia. And the key piece of the interface is a macro called ACC, uh, which is short for Accelerate. It also supports an additional domain-specific con construct, uh, which is called Run Stencil, for doing stencil computations, which I'll say more about in a minute. And for anything new, like Run Stencil that we add to Julia, there are two implementations. One as a library function that's written in Julia, and one high-performance native implementation. So that means that it's possible to turn off the compiler and run in library mode during development and debugging, and then turn on the compiler when it's time to deploy. And that lets us kind of sidestep some of the issues that hinder adoption of DSLs. So we implemented all this as a package for Julia called ParallelAccelerator.jl, and uh, it's available on GitHub. So um, I used to say at this point in the talk that it was one of the top 20 most popular Julia packages, but I think it's fallen off of the top 20 at this point, so I can't brag about that anymore. Um, but uh, let's see a couple examples of how it's used. So uh, this is a Julia implementation of the, the Black-Scholes option pricing benchmark. Um, and I, I feel kind of silly talking about this at Jane Street. And let me, let me tell you, the goal here is not to like, talk about how option pricing works, because I know nothing about that. Um, but the goal is instead to just give you an idea of the kind of code that Parallel Accelerator can parallelize. So we have this function, uh, Black-Scholes, which takes five arguments. And all these arguments are arrays of numbers. And this, this function does a lot of computations involving pointwise addition and subtraction and multiplication and division on those arrays. And I've highlighted all of those operations here in red. So this code is written entirely in what we call array style. And that means it's, it's really kind of screaming out to be parallelized with Parallel Accelerator. So to do that, we only had to make non-invasive additions to the code, which I've highlighted in yellow here. So we import the Parallel Accelerator library at the top with using Parallel Accelerator. It's what you write in Julia. And then we annotate the Black-Scholes function with this ACC annotation. Other than that, the rest of the code is just regular Julia. And what Parallel Accelerator does now is it translates these pointwise array operations into data parallel map operations. And it's also possible for Parallel Accelerator, Accelerator to avoid certain array bounds checking once we've established that the input arrays and the output arrays are the same size. And it can also fuse some of these operations to avoid allocating intermediate arrays. So that, that means it goes faster. So without Parallel Accelerator, the original code here took about 22 seconds to run in Julia when the arrays that we're passing in have 100 million elements each. So let's see how that compares to Parallel Accelerator. And while we're at it, we'll also compare to MATLAB. So these are running times that I collected for this Black-Scholes code when each of those arrays have a, has 100 million elements, as I said. And this plot shows speed up. So higher is better here. So on the left, first, there's MATLAB. Uh, and uh, the two bars in the middle are results for plain Julia without parallel accelerator, uh, one in array style and one with explicit for loops. By the way, notice that the version with the explicit for loops is a little bit faster. Um, this is something that's kind of weird. Uh, in Julia, uh, writing explicit for loops, like in traditional Julia, is 
faster than writing aggregate array operations. And in fact, we got some pushback when we developed this library because people thought it was going to encourage people to write non-idiomatic Julia because explicit for loops were considered idiomatic. Uh, thankfully, the Julia team was on our side on this and they thought we were doing the right thing. Um, but, uh, but we did get a little pushback from people who thought that we were encouraging people to write Julia the wrong way. Um, so yeah, so, so we see that the Julia results are a little bit uh, slower than MATLAB, but they're like in the same ballpark. And then we get to the parallel accelerator results, which are in blue on the right. So uh, I have a, a couple different versions. We're using a 36 core machine here. So we have 36 threads of parallelism available to us. If we use even just one thread under parallel accelerator, we run in just over 13 seconds. And that's with the array style code that I showed on the previous slide. So that's, it's already a bit of a speed up over plain Julia, and that's because of that uh, getting rid of that intermediate array allocation and array bounds checking that I, that I mentioned. But then we can add parallel, parallelism to that and run on 36 threads, which is this rightmost bar. And for that, the running time drops down to half a second, and which is over 40 times faster than our original code. And all we had to do was import the parallel accelerator library and add that one annotation. Uh, so we're really happy with this. This code also is kind of expressly chosen to, to illustrate the advantages of this style, right? So we don't always get results this good. Um, but um, uh, this is an example of the sort of thing that you can do with Parallel Accelerator. I want to show one more example. And this next oh, one, question. yeah, go ahead. So for my lab, support this dot multiplication. And mm -hmm. it automatically parallel if we have multiple, multiple core like architecture. So it doesn't use all the 36 cores. This only gets three times the speed up. Yeah, this is, yeah, so, so the, the, the lighter colored MATLAB bar is, um, is like with the single thread argument to, uh, to, to MATLAB, and then the other one is just what it does automatically, and yeah, yeah. Maybe the default thread number is used is set at like a 12 or something, not like a 36, maybe, yeah. I don't know, I mean, I... I always did that because you can so have a default number of Number of threads like that it does support this vector operation directly. It does, yeah. So, so yeah. So the darker colored MATLAB bar is like its default parallelization settings. Um, so I think there's. Uh, I I can't remember what those settings are. Um, but but this is kind of like what it does out of the box. Um, there might be ways to make it better, you know. Um, but I kind of I put Mat MATLAB up here as an example because it's it, usually it seems like what the issue is is you know somebody starting with Julia who's coming to Julia from MATLAB, they're surprised at first when their their Julia code is slower than MATLAB because everybody told them that Julia was supposed to be super fast. So uh, and this is you know indeed what we observed as well that MATLAB was a little bit faster out of the box. So what we're trying to show people is that you can make things super fast with Julia, but at least at the time it had no native parallelization. So um, you, um, you, you, you can get really great performance out of it, but you have to do more, uh, you, you have to use a tool that actually takes advantage of the parallel hardware that you have. Um, so the, this other example that I want to talk about uses this run stencil uh, uh, construct that I mentioned. So uh, I'll talk a, a briefly about stencil computations. So a stencil computation is a computation involving an array of some kind. It could be a one-dimensional array or a two-dimensional or whatever. And you want to update every element in the array based on the nearby elements. So kind of the classic hello world example of stencil computations is you want to blur an image that's represented as a two-dimensional array of pixels. So in order to blur an image, you change the value of every pixel to a particular average of that pixel's value and the values of the neighboring pixels. And that's what this code does. It's a weighted average of uh, that pixel's value and the, and the values of the pixels around it. Um, and this, this is like for a black and white image, so we don't have like all the different channels, uh, but it would be similar for a color image. So here we have, uh, we're using the run stencil construct that <laughs> Parallel Accelerator gives you. Um, but it doesn't look all that different from what you would write in plain Julia if you were writing this code in array style. But in plain Julia, it would actually be quite slow. So if we ran this on a large image for 100 iterations, then the plain Julia version of this code without run stencil would take almost 900 seconds to run. So let's see how that compares to Parallel Accelerator. So again, uh, I've got MATLAB results here too. And again, MATLAB's a little bit faster than plain Julia. And then there are the parallel accelerator results. So this is where I think things get exciting. So the first blue bar shows the speed up for parallel accelerator just on one thread. 
And when we do that, the running time drops down to under 40 seconds. And then when we add parallelism to that, which is on the right, then we're down to 1.4 seconds, which is more than 600 times faster than the Julia code. Now, for this one, we did have to do more work to get uh, the speed up than we, than we had to for the Black-Scholes code, because for this one, we had to use that run stencil construct that's specific to parallel accelerator, and we had to rewrite a few lines of Julia to use it. But it, it, the run stencil version is really not that different from the plain Julia code that it's replacing. I don't have a, code showing, a slide showing the plain Julia code, but it's in our GitHub repo, so you can go see it for yourself if you want. Um, so, so that's run stencil. And so before I finish this part of the talk, I, I want to say something about the impact of Parallel Accelerator. So Parallel Accelerator in Julia itself didn't have that much of an impact. I think it mentioned it was near the top of, of this um, Julia package popularity list for a while, but it kind of quickly dropped off. Uh, and the Julia ecosystem uh, changes pretty quickly. So. Um, it didn't make that much of an impact on Julia, but the impact that it had was actually elsewhere. So it was used as the basis uh, for another high-performance DSL for deep neural networks that appeared at PLDI 16. And then my colleague Asan Tatoni developed a distributed data analytics toolkit called HPAT that's based on it that appeared at a conference a couple years ago too. But what I think is really most exciting is that some of my colleagues at Intel, and I can take no credit for this, they ported the parallel accelerator technology to Python, and they integrated it with the Numba compiler for numerical programming in Python. So this is now part of Numba. I think it was actually the largest external contribution that Numba has ever accepted. And it makes it possible for Numba users to run their code multi-threaded. And it's with almost no user intervention. You just have to turn on a particular option to Numba. And this is a post on the Anaconda blog from last December that you can check out to learn more about that. All right, so that wraps up the part of the talk about non-invasive DSLs for productive parallelism and how they also, I think, exemplify finding the right high-level abstractions to enable efficient computation. And finally, I want to change gears yet again and talk about this third project that's been my obsession of late and that I presented at SysML last year on using SMT solvers to verify properties of neural networks used in safety critical software. And I'll talk about how that fits in nicely with our guiding principle and how it even connects back to all the other stuff I talked about and points to a longer term research agenda. And I should mention that uh, most of this uh, is, well, all of this is done in collaboration with a group of people at Stanford who did really most of the work. All right, so let's talk about safety critical software systems. In safety critical settings, it's prudent, if not actually required by law, to rigorously show that certain bad things can't happen before you use a piece of software. And today we have some good tools for formal verification of software, often based on SMT solvers. The trouble is that verification tools aren't necessarily keeping pace with how safety critical software is being built. In particular, often safety critical software is now using neural networks. And the example that I'm gonna focus on here is from a paper that published, was published in 2016 by my collaborators in the aeronautics and astronautics department at Stanford. So their goal here was to decrease the storage space requirements of an aircraft collision avoidance system. And they wanted to do this so that it would fit in memory on the verified hardware on board an aircraft. And they found that by representing this collision avoidance policy as a neural network, it took up much less space than the original implementation they have. Uh, but as they write here, there are significant certification concerns with neural network representations, which may be addressed in the future. <laughs> So let's look a little bit about this at the system that they're discussing. So this is an overview of the system. Um, this is before we get to the neural network part. So it runs on board an aircraft during flight and once per second, it collects sensor measurements and it produces one of five of what are called resolution advisories. So the most common resolution advisory is COC, which stands for clear of conflict, uh, which means that the plane doesn't need to do anything special. And there are four others, which are weak left turn, weak right turn, strong left turn, and strong right turn. And the resolution advisory that the system produces is the result of a lookup in a table, which is this table here, it's optimized logic table. So for each of about 120 million possible states of the environment that you see when you do one of these sensor uh, readings, where a state, a state describes the relationship between your aircraft and this possible <laughs> intruder aircraft, for every one of those 120 million possible states, the table has an entry that gives a score to each one of those five advisories, uh, COC, weak left, weak right, et cetera. 
And this table is really, really big. It needs hundreds of gigabytes of storage, and this is too big to fit in memory on verified hardware. And it has to be in memory, because these table lookups have to be fast. So hence this idea that these folks at Stanford had of training a neural network on the table and then storing that trained model instead of storing the whole table. So what does that look like? Well, the input to the trained network is a state of the environment, just like we saw on the previous slide. And the output is a score for each one of those uh, advisories. And this network, the trained network, uh, the storage space it takes up is smaller than what the original table took up by a factor of 1,000, which makes it small enough to fit in memory on their hardware. It takes like a few megabytes. However, the, the trained network is only an approximation of the original table. So to illustrate what that looks like, uh, here are some illustrations of, these are like top-down views of encounters between our aircraft and an intruder aircraft. And the color at every point in the plot here shows the advisory that would be issued if the intruder aircraft were at that location. So on the left is what the original table's advisories would say to do. And the plot on the right is what the neural network would advise for you to do. So they're obviously not the same. But it might not necessarily be a problem that they're not the same. The question is whether or not certain properties that we care about still hold. So for example, we might want to prove that if the intruder is close, let's say it's 15,000 feet away, which is considered close, and it's approaching from the left, then the network will always advise strong right. So once we know those properties that we're interested in showing, we can try to use an SMT solver to try to prove that they hold. Uh, so let's talk about how that would work. Well, so the first step is to take that trained network that we want to prove something about and take the property that we want to prove. And we encode them both as a huge Boolean formula. So in this case of this network, every unit in this network will become a variable in the formula. And everything that relates to that unit will become part of the formula somehow as a constraint on that variable. And now we have something that we can determine the satisfiability or unsatisfiability of by feeding it to an SMT solver. So what is SMT? Well, you, you might have heard of the SAT problem, and that's the problem of determining whether a Boolean formula is satisfiable, whether there's a satisfying assignment of true or false to every variable in the formula. SMT stands for satisfiability modular theories, and the SMT problem is an extension of the SAT problem. So it's also about determining whether a formula is satisfiable, but instead of just being a formula with Boolean variables in it, the formula can be more complicated in the case of SMT. So in this case, uh, instead of just being a Boolean formula, it can contain expressions that come from what's called a theory. That's the T in SMT. In this case, it's the theory of linear real arithmetic. So that means that the variables in this formula, instead of just uh, being Boolean variables, now they can be real numbers. And we can do addition and subtraction and multiplication on them. So this is the overall strategy. We construct this giant formula, we hand it off to the SMT solver, and we let the solver crank on the problem for a long, long time until it returns satisfiable or unsatisfiable. So uh, right now we're working with this, this uh, um, theory of real arithmetic. This is what's called a decidable theory. So that should mean that the solver should eventually have an answer for us. But in practice, it's really slow. SMT solving is often really slow. And so a big part of research in this area is trying to find more efficient ways to determine the satisfiability of a formula. So there are traditionally two approaches to constructing to, to the architecture of an SMT solver. And the first one of these is what's called the eager approach, in which you take the SMT formula and you essentially compile it down to a Boolean SAT formula. And then you can solve it with a SAT solver. So in principle, as long as you have a decidable theory, you can do that in much the same way that you can compile code in a high-level language to machine code. But it turns out that this is not actually the approach that most modern solvers take. And that's because it, it turns out to be really inefficient. If you compile to a plain old Boolean SAT formula, you may lose a lot of the high-level structure of the problem that you started with. And then you lose the ability to apply domain knowledge from whatever theory you had. So for example, addition is commutative. And if you want to exploit that fact that 3 plus 4 equals 4 plus 3, then you have to be able to talk about addition. And if you're working at a level where you can talk about addition, it's easy. But it's hard to do if you only have Boolean expressions in the same way that it's, uh, it's hard to write machine code. So if you take the eager route, then you end up having to do a lot more work to prove whatever it is that you want to prove. <clears throat> 
So what is more popular is this lazy approach to SMT solving. And in the lazy approach, you still have an underlying SAT solver, but you have all of these what are called theory solvers that are each specific to a different theory. And the solver looks something like this picture, which is taken from one of Clark Barrett's talks. So here you have several different theory solvers at the top. So here, I guess it's the theory of uh, uninterpreted functions, theory of arithmetic, theory of arrays, theory of bit vectors. And these are all talking to a piece called the solver core, and then a SAT solver underneath that this, the core communicates with. And this is yet another example of this principle of finding the right high-level abstractions to enable efficiency. In that last section of the talk, we talked about how with high-performance DSLs, it helps to have that high-level representation of programmer intent. And it's the same thing with lazy SMT. If you can do certain optimizations up at the level of the theory solver, then the problem can be solved a lot more efficiently than if you just eagerly compiled everything down to a SAT formula right away. And you really need all the help that you can get for, uh, for trying to solve things efficiently because we're working with problems that are NP-complete and we do encounter these worst case running times. And it turns out that to be able to verify anything interesting about reasonably sized neural networks, it's not enough to just have a solver for, say, the theory of linear real arithmetic. You also need the theory solver to have some domain knowledge about neural networks. This is what my colleagues at Stanford discovered. And, and here's why. So, Going back to this picture of the high-level verification strategy, we can expand out that SMT solver piece now that we've talked about SMT solver internals a bit. Uh, so we can expand that out to be a little more detailed. Uh, so we just talked about how lazy SMT solvers can have these different theory solvers depending on what theory our formulas are written with. In this case, I mentioned it's the theory of linear real arithmetic that we care about. And for that, our theory solver could be a linear programming solver or LP solver. But there's a catch, right? because our neural network has activation functions. And this is the thing that's stopping it from just being a linear combination of its inputs. Uh, it can learn much more interesting functions because it can also do this nonlinear stuff. So in this case, it happens to be a network with ReLU activations. A ReLU activation has to be encoded as a disjunction in our SMT formula that we compiled down to. Because it has to be encoded as a disjunction in the formula, that means it cannot be handled by the LP solver. Rather, it requires you to drop down to the level of the SAT solver. And dropping down to the level of the SAT solver makes things slow. So what my Stanford collaborators figured out is that you can take this LP solver and just make it a little bit smarter by adding a higher level ReLU primitive to this theory of linear real arithmetic. And that means that instead of eagerly splitting ReLUs into disjunctions, you can be lazy and leave them unsplit and proceed with trying to solve the rest of the problem. So in this case, using this higher level really primitive, instead of compiling it down to a disjunction to be handled by the SAT solver right away, this was enough to make this problem tractable. And I just want to show a few of the properties that this solver was able to show about that aircraft collision avoidance network using this lazy really sp splitting approach. So the interesting thing here, I think, is this last column, which says maximum ReLU split depth. So this network, for context here, this network is divided into subnetworks. And there's 300 ReLU activations in each of these subnetworks. Uh, that means that if you can think of a, a ReLU as being either on or off, that means there's two to the 300 possible combinations of on or off. 2 to the 300 is a really large number. And if the solver had to split every one of those ReLUs into disjuncts, then properties like these would be impossible to verify in any reasonable amount of time. But it turns out it doesn't have to do that. It only has to split a small fraction of them. So that's what this ReLU split depth is here. Uh, for example, the first one is 22. So we still have to look at 2 to the 22, which is still a big number, but it's a lot less than 2 to the 300. So in general, we're looking at running times of tens of hours to prove or disprove these properties rather than the lifetime that they would take if we didn't have this lazy ReLU splitting. So in the use of this higher level uh, ReLU constraint and this custom theory solver that knew about neural network activation functions was what enabled the solver to work efficiently. And uh, I did a workshop paper with uh, these folks in which we proposed extending this approach to verify properties of networks that use other kinds of activations, uh, such as sigmoid functions, by using approximations of those functions that are piecewise linear. Uh, we have not actually implemented this yet. Uh, if you want to work on this, uh, talk to me. Uh, all right. So. I've talked a lot about a lot of different projects here, all of which kind of, I think, fit in with this guiding principle of finding the right high-level abstractions to enable efficient computation. And finally, I want to bring it back around to what I want to do in the future. So we've just saw that it is possible to formally verify properties of neural networks using SMT solvers 
if you're willing to dig into solver internals rather than just using an off-the-shelf solver. And in fact, I think this is true not just for neural networks, but in all kinds of domains where we want to make the use of solvers practical. So I would like to invest in developing new domain-specific solvers that are well-suited for the problems of parallel and distributed computing. In particular, I think that solvers that have baked-in support for reasoning about lattices and partial orders could get us a really long way. And then we also want to parallelize the solvers themselves. So this is a hard problem, and it's one that, to my knowledge, has never been done in a guaranteed deterministic by construction setting. And here's why I think this matters. So it's especially important to be able to safely and efficiently share state between different solver subtasks. Because the solver, remember, is cranking on this big formula. It needs to be able to work on different parts of that large formula in parallel. And we need those subtasks to be able to share knowledge with each other as we monotonically move toward getting more of that formula processed as solving goes along. So my hypothesis, as, as yet untested, is that we can exploit the same techniques that we developed for guaranteeing determinism in other setting, settings, and we can use them in this setting of parallel SMT solving, uh, which is kind of a holy grail. But I don't want to stop there. My long-term vision here is actually to democratize solver hacking. So what I want is a framework for quickly building high-performance domain-specific solvers. So today, it's common in a number of subfields of computer science for people to use off-the-shelf solvers as black boxes. If you go and pick out any random paper from Popple or PLDI, uh, they'll say, we used an SMT solver. But usually, people in, in this line of work don't necessarily dig into the internals of the solver. And to build your own theory solver, one would appear to need to be an SMT solver internals expert. Even though that architecture that we saw of the lazy uh, SMT solver with all those nice modular theory solvers, you'd think that would lend itself to this modular style of development in which theory solvers could be developed independently. But in practice, it would seem that SMT solvers are somewhat monolithic and that this SMT internals expertise is required. So I want to change that. My claim is that if you are a domain expert, if you know about distributed consistency, for example, you should not have to be an SMT internals expert in order to create a custom theory solver for your domain. So I mentioned that Delight framework for implementing high-performance DSLs, which tried to make it possible to rapidly implement high-performance DSLs without having to necessarily be an expert on the guts of compilers. I want that, but for implementing high-performance domain-specific solvers. And that's the long-term goal. And I think I'm going to be working on this for like the next five years to life. So if that sounds like something that you want to be part of, I'm looking for grad students. So get in touch. Um, I'm almost done. One final thing that I want to plug. Uh, so last term at UC Santa Cruz, I taught a course on languages and abstractions for distributed programming. And my students and I wrote a blog about what we did. So if you want to know what kinds of problems that I'm interested in, in this intersection of programming languages and distributed systems and verification, uh, go check out this blog. And my students did a lot of really great work on this. And I want to, uh, I want to share it with the world. And um, that's all I've got. And I would love to take questions. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering if there are any existing SMT solvers that you could use as a base for the kind of thing that you want to do, or if you think you have to like start from scratch. Yeah. So. The it's a great question. So the, the question is, could you use an existing SMT solver as the basis for what you want to do? Well, in principle, yes, right? So Z3, for example, is a solver that has an architecture that I, like I talked about, or CVC4. Um, they have this architecture where there's theory solvers and a solver core. And it should be possible, I think, for regular folks to develop theory solvers uh, that plug in nicely. Uh, but it's not easy to do. And I don't know if the, the problem is, so I would like to claim that the problem is uh, you know, largely cultural, right? Like regular people think they can't hack on SMT solvers. Uh, but I think maybe the problem is also technical. Maybe the problem is lack of documentation. Uh, maybe the problem is, uh, uh, well, I can't say that the problem is that the solvers aren't open source, because they are. Um, but just because the code is available doesn't mean it's easy to hack on. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, there are existing starting points. And I, there's kind of some folk knowledge about like, which solvers are easier to hack on than others uh, that I, I don't know is true, what, like, whether it's true or not.
Um, so you compared the performance between MATLAB and also using um, the uh, parallel accelerator. Um, yeah. I'm wondering if you had any like measurement to do with uh, the low level sort of refactoring oh. um, and how they compared. Low level, so like, so the question is into a performance language. Like yeah, C++. great question. Yeah, so the the question is, I, I I was only showing MATLAB and Julia results up here, and to really be fair, I would also have a column of like C plus plus. So if you look at our paper, uh, we had a. Uh, uh, expert C++ implementations of three of the workloads that we looked at. Uh, we didn't have them for all of them. And I, I, the reason for that is that expert parallel C++ implementations are often kind of hard to come by. Um, so the ones that we had were done by experts at Intel uh, who you know, are not me. And um, uh, so we, we had those for three workloads that we looked at. And so we were able to get like within uh, shouting distance of the expert implementations. I think we were like we, we were considering it a success if we could be like um, only twice as slow as C++. Um, and we and we got there. Uh, so I, I was really pleased with that. But you're you're right. It was um, it's it's kind of cheating to not put that on the slide as well. Yeah, Ron. So you cover, we're going down this approach of doing non-invasive DSL. Yeah. Or language really so there's another approach that people often do to mm -hmm. make the kind of ladder between the DSL and the ordinary language easier, which is to use embedded DSLs. Right. We show that more commonly in you know fancy type system languages. Like yeah, yeah. Camel and Haskell, and I'm kind of curious what you think are the trade-offs between this approach of like you know, where you're like more aggressively like hacking at the compiler level, yeah. and people can write the ordinary surface syntax and get the better behavior, versus something where you just use you know combinator style approaches. Yeah. Okay. To make it into the yeah. So, so Ron's question, I guess, is contrast uh, non-invasive DSLs with embedded DSLs. So, yeah. So a non-invasive DSL is a kind of embedded DSL. Uh, there's not necessarily like a firm definition of what non-invasive means. It's a, uh, this is a term that was coined by Jan Vitek, by the way. Uh, he really helped us figure out how to market this work, and he was the one who came up with this, this term non-invasive. I'm not kidding. Like it, it took us a while to get this paper published and trying to find the right story to tell, and it was Jan who helped us do it. Um, so I, I guess the, the question is, um, when would you need to do this versus, so I guess an example, you, you could also think of um, the Elvars library that, um, I, I didn't talk about it very much, but we have a library called Elvish uh, for writing uh, Elvars code. And um, you could think of it as an embedded DSL. And so in, in the same way, so all, all Elvars, El, Elvar operations run inside a, a particular monad. And I like to think of monads as DSLs. Um, but uh, so, so that's kind of one way of having an embedded DSL that's kind of enforced through the type system. Um, and, but there's like kind of this firm boundary between the DSL code and the rest of the code. So I guess a non-invasive DSL tries to make that boundary more porous. And whether one or the other is right for a problem is, uh, you know, depends on the problem. I guess I, guess I wonder specifically, it doesn't just make it kind of, you just issue about whether it's going to force, but how explicit it is, right? Mm -hmm. Like you sort of know sort of where the combinator ends and where the sort of core language code is. Yeah. And, and I wonder how, how that played out, for example, in the delivery of errors. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so the, the question is about errors. Yeah, so you're right. So one of the things that, uh, is kind of a struggle with when you're using parallel accelerator is if it runs into something it can't parallelize, uh, we kind of have to drop back to using the sequential version. And there's a lot of stuff that it can't parallelize. It can only parallelize this kind of narrow subset of Julia code that's like aggregate array operations on uh, uh, on arrays of numbers. So, um, it, for example, the like, uh, parallel accelerator can't handle strings, or at least last I checked, it can't handle strings. Um, so uh, what we tried to encourage people to do is not put the ACC annotation around giant blocks of code. Instead, start by putting it around tiny pieces of code and factor the code that does that stuff out you know, into small functions, which is maybe a good idea anyway. And then uh, um, have ACC around uh, those small functions, and, and then it can interact with the other code. Um, does that uh, kind of answer your question? Yeah, I guess there's a few things like when you produce errors yeah. for the user, like is that you do some kind of syntactic transformation, I imagine, between you know the code that you see and something that like I might recognize as 
a sort of, you know, a sort of kind of yeah. little sub language. Yeah. So I think I think what you're getting at is like kind of one of the the bugbears of programming with embedded DSLs is that you get error messages that are in the context of the language, uh, the underlying host language, rather than in the context of the DSL. So I think the Racket people have done a lot of amazing work on this, um, but a lot of the work ends up having to be like somebody's blood, sweat, and tears trying to to make the error messages good. And I am the first to confess that Parallel Accelerator does a bad job at this. Uh, so, um, you know, as is so often the case with research quality code. Uh, um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think there's, there are huge usability issues with DSLs, which I think is one of the reasons why they're not so widely adopted. And um, yeah, I, 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 I don't know. There's some, there's some racket people here, like Carl. You know, maybe he has like thoughts on, or I don't know, are you a racket person? Not actively, okay. Um, but, but yeah, I, I, I feel like those people are at the forefront of figuring out how to make uh, embedded DSLs and towers of embedded DSLs more usable. Uh, yes? So just kind of I was inspired by that previous question. Yeah. There was very similar sounding work, like Neil Conway's Bloom, which is mm -hmm. an embedded DSL in uh, Ruby, yeah. for doing almost exactly the same thing. Kind of, yeah. Could you contextualize those two pieces of work and kind of what have come since then <coughs> in kind of pushing this lattice programming? Yeah, you bet. Yeah, so yeah, so Bloom was was actually also worked on by my colleague Peter Alvaro at, at UCSC. So uh, he's like the office right next to mine. So we actually just submitted a grant proposal about trying to do this stuff. So um, yeah, so um, Bloom is a language for uh, uh, distributed programming, and it's uh, it's. And, and the work that Neil Conway did was called Bloom L, so kind of extending Bloom to programming over arbitrary lattices, whereas the original Bloom was just about sets. And so um, Bloom doesn't have a determinism guarantee, right? So Bloom is about um, distributed programming with guaranteed eventual consistency. But uh, eventual consistency is different from determinism, right? Because you can still observe intermediate results that are different. Uh, so like, for example, with the shopping cart, you know that your shopping cart is, your different replicas are eventually gonna converge, but in the meantime, you might see like one or the other thing in the cart. Um, so, uh, and Bloom actually does something interesting, which, uh, so they actually rule out, and, and especially in Bloom L, you're not allowed to do non-monotonic operations at all. Uh, so the only kinds of operations you can do in Bloom L is those that um, allow the contents of, of uh, your data structure to grow. Uh, and so this is, uh, this this is kind of a really you, one, some might say you know draconian <laughs> approach. Uh, whereas so with Elvars, um, what you might do is because this this uh, this Elvish library is in Haskell, what you might do is you might have certain parts of your code where the data structure is growing monotonically, and you would do those. Um, you would write those parts using the Elvish library. And then when you were done with that phase of the code where the data structure grew monotonically, you would freeze the Elvar and then just use it as a plain old regular data structure from that point on. So you can have like designated parts of your code where the data structure only grows monotonically. Whereas with Bloom, it's like, it must be the case all the time. Or with Bloom L at least, it must be the case all the time. Um, but you're right, these things are related. They're, they're Similar in a lot of ways, they're, they were done basically concurrently. And it, it's really interesting because, uh, so during my PhD work, uh, I was working on this stuff and uh, submitting papers and getting them rejected. And then uh, people from the distributed programming community actually came to me and they told me that they were interested in my work. So it was distributed systems people who were interested in what I was doing before any PL people were interested. And then that's sort of how I became part of the distributed systems community and then ended up uh, um, kind of jumping into it with both feet later. So um, there's, and, and I would love to enable more interaction between these communities, and that's what I'm trying to do now. Yeah. So uh, the parallel accelerator has some uh, parallels to uh, uh, the one of vectorizing that you see in GCC and LVM. Mm -hmm. uh, and traditionally, when you do the vectorizing, the problem is that uh, it work. <laughs> uh, and so you get it working, you look at the assembly, it's great, and then two months later it doesn't work anymore because you change the line in the middle. Mm. Yeah. Uh, it's, really, it's really fragile, so the abstraction just doesn't meet your, your goal of uh, you know, your high level abstraction for you know, uh, encouraging the efficient computation. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, it's so bad that you end up often just writing intrinsics. Yeah. That's fine because you can see on, that, on your uniform, it's not, not near the productive side, uh -huh. it's fine. And on the 
Yeah, but yeah. All these productive languages, you kind of want to avoid that. So I'm wondering, mm -hmm. in your work with Pamela Ritzlodin, did you explore like any sort of robust abstractions where if someone steps outside of the tradition, it tells you or lets you know? Yeah, that's a great question. So let me try to, to paraphrase the question. So um, kind of com comparing parallel accelerator to auto vectorization, uh, you, yeah, I mean, I think you run into the same problems where it, you might, like the, the Black-Scholes code, for instance, we were only doing operations that Parallel Accelerator knows about and can parallelize, but if we had the code were a little different, uh, there's, there's actually, like Parallel Accelerator cannot parallelize all uh, Julia array operations, right? It, it can parallelize a set of them that it knows about. And so you... Uh, you still have correctness because we'll just fall back to using the, the original sequential version if we can't parallelize the code, but it might not be fast. And so um, the, I, I think you know, what, what, what you're asking for is something that will give you some kind of like optimization advice, like warning, you're trying to introduce an operation that the, um, that the parallelizer, or in your case, the auto vectorizer, won't be able to handle. So what should you do? And so I, I think that's a fascinating question. Uh, I, I don't know the answer. <laughs> yeah. Could you comment on the scalability? I mean, in the SMP based replication neural networks, like mm -hmm. what kind of scalability do you have on these big networks? Or? So. The, the short answer is it's not where it needs to be. Uh, so the work that, that the, the, um, st the team at Stanford did on this system called Reluplex, that's what this, uh, this system was that I was talking about, uh, was able to handle networks that were a couple of, order of orders of magnitude bigger than what the previous best approach for verifying properties of neural networks with SMT solvers could do. That previous approach was uh, work published in uh, 2010, and it was able to verify things about a network that was tiny. It was like 10 neurons. Um, so they were looking at, uh, they, they had a larger network, and then they divided it into these sub-networks of 300 uh, activations or 300 neurons each, and then, which is still really small, right? But it was a couple or orders of magnitude bigger than what they could do before. Um, and you know, if you look at the whole network, um, but that's, it's still not necessarily able to handle like modern, reasonably sized neural networks. So there's been some follow-up work that's really interesting. Um, there was a paper, I think, called AI Squared. It was like abstract interpretation for AI, uh, which was about uh, trying to be even smarter about, uh, I see Ron laughing. Yeah, the, the, the titles of these things are sometimes funny. Um, but um, yeah, so uh, the, I, I, have not yet taken the time to sit down and understand the work, but they were able to uh, uh, do uh, you know, what Reloplex was doing, but in an even more efficient way by pruning off larger pieces of the search space, or I think by being able to put parts of, the, of a search space in, in the same equivalence class and kind of applying this abstract interpretation approach to, to, um, to solving, which I think is super cool and I wish I understood better. Um, so, the, the state of the art has advanced a little bit in terms of you know, how big of a network you can handle, but it's still not where, it, has, where it's, it ought to be. And I think really an even bigger problem is just even writing down the properties that you want to prove about these networks in the first place. So in the case of this aircraft collision avoidance system, you can state the properties that you want to prove fairly straightforwardly in terms of uh, if, we, if the input falls within a certain class, then the output should fall within a certain class. And you can do that because the input is, in some sense, relatively high level. It's like this airplane is here, the other airplane is there, they're going this fast. But if the input were something like pixels from a camera, then how do you write down a property, you know, like, you know, if this pixel is this, you know, if this, the, this uh, array of pixels is this, how do you write down the property like this car doesn't hit a pedestrian? Uh, so I think there's like this fundamental issue uh, with networks that, uh, you know, they're, the, the first layer of the network is operating on this very low level input data to even be able to write down the property that you want to verify in terms of the relationship between inputs and outputs. And I think that's an, an even harder problem. So kind of related to that, I was wondering, yeah. what, once you have a, this point where you the things I really care about in this network mm -hmm. are the following fairly clear and small set of properties. Mm -hmm. Like, doesn't that point to like a significantly better compression story, which is hmm. you can just, like in some sense you have this sort of fairly simple property which feels like maybe a more, like, or, or is the story that like you want to like, these are like 
rough sanity conditions we want to make sure are true, mm -hmm. but actually we care about some other kind of rough equivalence that we don't know how to express between the particular, like I'm kind of wondering how, how, how complete of a correctness story yeah. are these theories and like, I also wonder this because I wonder like how applicable is this in other cases like, yeah. do you need these proofs because there's somewhere in like the airline ch safety checklist huh. that says you should have like proofs about things? Yeah, yeah. Or does it really capture like at the core what the important is? Yeah, that's a great question. So the, the, I, I guess, you know, one way to talk about this question is say, how do we decide what property we needed to prove there? Like when I said, you know, uh, the the uh, collision avoidance system always says to take a, a, a strong left when the intruder is near and approaching from the right. Um, so if that's the case, then it, like if how do you how do you know that that and you know maybe a handful of other properties are the interesting ones to prove? And how do you know that once you've proven those, then you've covered the space of bad things that could happen? And I mean, this is uh, not limited to this situation, right? Like always in verification, then there's a question about, are you trying to verify the right things? And um, yeah, so, so somebody asked me, like, if we had a proof of, quote unquote, full functional correctness of the uh, aircraft collision avoidance system. And it's like, no, you know, we have proofs of these particular properties that we were able to write down. Uh, were those the right ones? I don't know. Uh, so. Uh, you know, people who know more about that domain might be able to say more. And we had people who were domain experts uh, involved in this project, uh, but I don't know, um, you know, what claims they would necessarily make about, and, and I think, you know, this is kind of the same, like, anytime you ask, is this piece of software safe? You know, it's kind of like, if you ask a security person, is this piece of software secure, right? Well, the answer is like, what is your threat model, you know? and. It's the same here, right? What is your threat model? What are the things that you think could go wrong? And we can protect against those things, but we don't know what we don't know. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I don't have an answer that's better than that. Yes? Um, for the Alvarez, you talked a little bit like quasi-determinism. Yeah. yeah. And, um, I'm kind of curious, like, what, is it possible to um, prove statically without having to run that mm -hmm. it simply won't error out or that it <coughs> will throw an error, right? Like you, you like if you were to eyeball it, if you throw something and then you try to ask like write to it or something, right? That yeah. should throw an error, but is there any attempt to actually statically verify these things rather than just yeah. prove um, this quality determinism? Yeah, so there are type systems for uh, ensuring determinism. And uh, the, probably one of the best known of those is something called DPJ uh, or deterministic parallel Java. And um, so DPJ is an, an extension to Java, and you can, uh, you can put it in annotations in that will say that one operation commutes with another, and then it'll do this uh, um, uh, sophisticated type checking to try to make sure that your, your program is deterministic. So uh, LVARS is actually not a type system. Um, and in fact, uh, one thing that has always um, irritated me about the LVARS work is that uh, we're relying on certain assumptions, right? I, like I talked about the assumptions that the programmer had to make of uh, those Elvar libraries, right? Like they're they're assuming that whoever wrote that library uh, did their homework and made those uh, the, the the read and write operations uh, have those properties of commutativity and in, in inflationariness and. Uh, and that read operations uh, would correspond to threshold sets. But we don't have anything that proves that that's the case in the LVAR library per se. So this idea of verified LVARs is actually something else that I want to do. And um, so Nikki Vazu had a little bit of work on like proving commutativity uh, in liquid Haskell, uh, which is relevant to this. Um, uh, but she was, what she was doing was she was looking at like, so in Haskell there's like the ORD type class, uh, which says like you, um, the ORD type class uh, uh, says that the the elements of a, the, the values that have a certain type uh, are, are a partial order, or a, excuse me, a total order. Um, but there's nothing like in Haskell that actually proves that that is true. So um, she did like a verified ORD type class where it actually calls off to the SMT solver that Liquid Haskell uses. And so you know that your ORD actually means ORD when you're using her system. So uh, in principle, you could do something like that with um, uh, uh, with everything that you need to do to ensure that something actually is a lattice. Uh, uh, and um, I, I want to do that. So that's a, like yet another thing on my list. Just like one more question. Sure. One more question. Who wants to be last? <laughs> 
All right. Thank you.